One of the things I think is important for us to understand about Act 31 is that it was unprecedented in its specificity in terms of educational policy directives to local school boards. When the state legislature declared that every school board must ensure that students receive instruction in history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the federally recognized tribes and bands, that went well beyond anything previous to that date. So one of the things that I, I think about as we look back to that era is we can see that in 1989, we were making the national news. What they were showing of Wisconsin was not pretty. They were showing violent, often racist protests at boat landings against the Ojibwe people who were exercising court-affirmed treaty rights. I ran across a statement in my dissertation research, this idea that we can evaluate our educational programs not based on short-term measures like test scores, but upon the actions of our alumni. And so one of the things that we were seeing in Wisconsin is a lot of the alumni of our school systems acting out on the boat landings based on the, the lack of knowledge that we had equipped them with as public schools. One thing that we see in the statutes and the way they're constructed is that this problem was looked at and recognized as being quite complex. And so the legislature directed the state superintendent, the head of the Department of Public Instruction, to collaborate with an entity called the American Indian Language and Culture Education Board to address that immediate issue of opportunity to learn and create curriculum for grades four to 12 on Chippewa Treaty rights. The second piece that we think about is that if you look at some of the really hateful rhetoric at the boat landings, it wasn't just limited to native people. That, as I understand it, was part of the impetus for taking this broader human relations piece. And so let's understand human differences in a way that addresses some of those underlying issues as well. That it's native people now, but really there's a broader lack of awareness and understanding. One of the other pieces uh, addresses teacher education. You cannot ask a teacher to teach that which he or she has not him or herself had the opportunity to learn. That the state superintendent, again meaning DPI, who actually provides educator licenses, cannot issue someone a license unless they have received instruction in human relations and the history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the federally recognized tribes and bands in Wisconsin. It also then addresses those who did a teacher education program out of state and are coming to Wisconsin to work as a professional educator. And so they're licensed with what they call stipulations initially, and they cannot become a fully licensed teacher until they themselves have had this instruction as well. So there's another piece which addresses uh, curriculum materials. The need for instructional materials that reflect cultural pluralism and human diversity. We are preparing our students to be global citizens, to be successful adults in communities that may be quite different than the community they're currently growing up in. Which is not to say where you are is not good, but let's provide you with a broader understanding and not limit you based on what home might demographically look like. And the other piece is often thought of as sort of the heart and soul of Act 31. And that's the requirement in the statute that every public school district provide instruction in the history, culture, and tribal sovereignty of the federally recognized tribes and bands at least twice in the elementary grades, for statutory purposes K-8, and at least once in high school. And so we can think about meeting our responsibilities to the statutory requirements by providing the instruction in social studies but we can also think about good quality educational decisions that might incorporate these teachings across the curriculum. And again, those five different components of the statute addressing five different slices of the problem in five different ways. And so we can think about this as a response to a problem that existed in a particular configuration in 1989 and we can see present day echoes of those same underlying misunderstandings. And it's our responsibility, legally and ethically as educators, to act to address those in a good way.